Well, I invite you to take your Bibles at this time and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. As this is our 12th message now in this study through the book of 2 Timothy, written by the Apostle Paul, the very last of his 13 epistles, as he is now in prison in Rome, never to be released again. This time he will be executed as a martyr for Jesus Christ, an enemy of the state as far as Rome sees him, but a true victor in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he writes this last epistle to address the subject of the last days and faithfulness in the last days. And we've seen thus far in our study of 2 Timothy, faithfulness amidst affliction in chapters 1 and chapter 2. And then in chapter 2, through most of the remaining part of the epistle, he addresses being faithful amidst apostasy. And we've seen how to respond to false teachers and teaching, and the apostasy of the last days, as well as fidelity in the last days. And in our last message, and at the end of chapter 3, we saw the holy scriptures that God has provided for these unholy last days. But today we're going to look at chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, that addresses the preaching of God's word in these last days. It says in chapter 4, verse 1, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And so in verses 1 through 5, we see a simple message, but very important, to preach the word of God in these last days. These are very clear and simple instructions given to us as the priority for the church in these last days. And as I thought of this, I thought of a modern day parable involving sailors. This is the story of a ship captain who guided a large vessel through the fog on the high seas. On his radar screen, he could see another large vessel coming directly at him and his ship. So he radioed the encroaching ship and said, Please turn 10 degrees north. We're headed your way. The reply said, No, you turn 10 degrees south. The captain, disturbed, said, This is Captain so-and-so, and and I say to you, turn 10 degrees north. The reply came back, well, this is third-class seaman Bob Phillips, and I say to you, turn 10 degrees south. The captain, now furious with anger, said, listen here, son, this is one of America's great battleships, and I'm ordering you turn 10 degrees north. The reply came back, no, sir, you turn 10 degrees south. This is a lighthouse. There are many ministries and many churches in our day and many pastors of churches that are stubborn just like that captain who think they're leading their congregations through the fog, so to speak, but they're not even following the Word of God and clear instructions that would pull the ship through in times of danger. And I like this story because God has not left us to figure out our way through the fog or the dark. He's given us very clear instructions in His Word. And in verses 1 through 5, as we've just read them, we see a charge where we are to preach the Word of God. We're given a charge as if we're in a courtroom with witnesses before us. The two witnesses being God the Father and God the Son. And one day we're going to be judged as church age saints before the judgment seat of Christ as to whether we followed these instructions. And the primary charge is 
Preach the word. Preaching, meaning heralding like a messenger of the king. The message is very simple. We don't have to come up with our own. We just have to repeat and teach what God or the king has handed to us. And secondly, we are then to stand upon the word of God and not waver or come up with our own message that we think we can improve upon what God has said. This message sometimes will involve the necessity to reprove and rebuke, which is viewed as negative, but it is necessary. At times, it will also involve the positive ministry of exhortation or encouragement. And this charge has been standing for the last 2,000 years now of church history. But there is a tendency, even among evangelical so-called Bible-based churches in our day, to not follow this clear-cut command. You know, sometimes believers say, well, you know, all we ever do at Duluth Bible Church is have Bible, Bible, Bible. Can't we have something different? Well, what different thing would you want? Could we watch some more videos? Maybe a little more entertainment? How about some drama? A drama team here at Duluth Bible Church. Now, we're going to have a play this weekend. Once every two years, our young people do this, but it's not a substitute for the teaching of the Word of God. No, we don't need drama teams or church theater groups as some churches are having. Or sometimes people say, well, how about if we shorten our service times, have shorter preaching, and and maybe change the percentage of time so that we have more praise and worship time and a lot less preaching of the Word of God. That's what a lot of churches are doing today. In fact, what that says in essence is that our music, the message of the music, is above the Word of God itself. And I don't think that's the case. In fact, I'm reminded of a a story I heard about Donald Gray Barnhouse, a preacher of yesteryear, the last century. He was at a Youth for Christ event where he was invited as the keynote speaker. And he was told that he would have around half an hour to an hour to preach, so he had prepared a message. And when he went to this meeting, he listened as the music team went on and on and on and on and chewed up 45 minutes to 50 minutes of his allotted time, leaving him 10 to 15 minutes to preach. So when he was called to the platform and he was to address the audience, he said, since you think so little of the word of God that you left me such little time to preach, let's just pray and call it a meeting. And he did, and he exited the stage. And there was a hush over the audience. He made his point. You see, we are called upon in this dispensation of grace to preach The Word of God in these last days, which is what the church needs today, as we'll see. And this is a solemn charge from the Lord. That's why verse 1 begins, I charge you, Paul says, to Timothy, but this is given to the whole church as an example to follow. We see charges for ministry in the last days in verses 1 and 2. And in verse 1 in particular... We see that all believers in Christ, but especially pastor teachers, are given an exhortation in verse 1, as though we are in a courtroom before witnesses. In fact, you see the root word to charge there in verse 1, it's martyr. It's where we get witness from. But the verb form with the preposition dia in front of it intensifies it, and this is actually used in secular Greek of the first century, as a technical term for being in a courtroom and being a witness in that setting. And so this is a solemn charge that we have before the Lord. And who are the two witnesses in this courtroom before whom we stand with this charge? God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who. And God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ are observing our lives right now. We are in their presence. 
And that's how we live our life. And we are going to give an account to the Lord Jesus Christ one day. In fact, verse 1 goes on to say, of Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, therefore preach the word. All authority was given to the Lord Jesus Christ. When he ascended into high, he ascended in glory, and he is Lord of all, the book of Acts tells us, Acts 17, Paul preached that, and therefore he has authority when he comes back to judge the entire world, whether it's people yet alive or those who've already died. And he will do this at his appearing and his kingdom, it says in this passage. And so the reason for this charge is that there is a coming judgment for our world, even for church-age believers, you and me. And that will occur in conjunction with Christ's appearing, namely the rapture, and with his kingdom. Now which judgment is being referred to here? And what does this involve? Well, first it says appearing here. I think this is in reference to the rapture. And one of the terms for the rapture event is not merely the word coming, but also appearing. When Jesus Christ appears or is revealed, the revelation of Jesus Christ. All those are rapture terms, being caught up and thus seeing the Lord Jesus Christ. And in conjunction with that, once we are caught up, the next event in heaven, once we're there, is that we will have our lives judged as believers in Jesus Christ for how we lived our life from the time we were born again until the time we died or went home to be with the Lord at the rapture. And so, the event that's being referred to here, it's not, it's not, uh, let's try this. There we go. Is the rapture followed by the judgment seat of Christ in heaven for the church of the last 2,000 years. That is the judgment that is being referred to here. But we know that his kingdom will come as well. We will come back with him seven years later down to the earth, and he will set up his kingdom. The kingdom age will last initially a thousand years, but then go on into eternity, Daniel 7 says. And there are seven judgments according to the scriptures. Seven major judgments. You know what the greatest judgment of all was? The cross of Calvary, where the innocent, sinless Lamb of God took all of our sin upon himself as God the Father poured out our just judgment that we deserved upon that innocent substitute. That was the greatest judgment that will ever take place in all of human history. And that was passed 2,000 years ago. The second judgment is the judgment seat of Christ, where all the great company of saints down through the last 2,000 years will have our earthly walk and work evaluated before Jesus Christ, not to judge us for our sins, those were paid for at Calvary, but rather to determine our eternal reward. And what you get at that moment is what your eternal reward will be to serve Jesus Christ with in that eternal kingdom. So is your life of great significance and value in terms of how you serve the Lord now? Yes, absolutely yes. It may not seem like it, because we don't see the kingdom right now. But we're told about it in Scripture, so we have to take it by faith, and God will honor and reward that with the, the rewards we get at the judgment seat of Christ. So that's the second great judgment. But then there will be at the end of the tribulation, right here in conjunction with Christ's return to the earth, the judgment of the nations, the sheep and goat judgment as the nations will be judged based on how they treated Christ's brethren, the Jews, Matthew 25 says. And there'll be a separation of Gentiles based on whether they were sheep or whether they were goats in God's estimation. And at that moment as well, the nation of Israel will be judged. Those who are saved within Israel, this is the fourth judgment, they will go into the kingdom with their eternal reward. And then a fifth judgment will occur at the end of the thousand years. Revelation 20 says uh, another Gog and Magog judgment where Satan is re 
least re released from his captivity, gathers up uh, a hostile percentage of the population at the end of the thousand years. They revolt against Jesus Christ, and that's immediately put down. And then comes the great white throne judgment right here, along with the judgment of fallen angels or demons. So that's the sixth and the seventh judgments. Seven judgments that are major. And yet we have this one to look forward to. At his appearing in his kingdom, we will be evaluated, not for our sins, but whether we were faithful in following what he told us to do. And what did he tell us to do? Verse 1 says, in light of all this, here's your command. It's very simple. Verse 2, preach the word. Preach the word. The word preach is keruso in Greek, and it simply means to proclaim a message like the herald of a king. You know, the, the forerunner who would go before a king if he was coming, that forerunner would announce, hear ye, hear ye. Here's the message from the king. And so what this implies is not necessarily, you know, the volume of your preaching, that you have to be loud when you preach. That's not really the main point. The point is the authority behind it. That you are commissioned by the king himself. In fact, all of us as believers have been given a great commission to preach the gospel starting here in our Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. But as I think of this proclamation that being a herald of the king, we are not told to improve upon the message to philosophize, to psychologize, or to become political, politicize. We are not to dramatize the Word of God. All of these things. We are just to be faithful with it in proclaiming it to others. In fact, what this underscores for us as well in verse 2 is even the priority of a pastor teacher. That though it's true, I am to administrate in a local church, even do counseling and, and address needs individually, or even to, you know, hatch them, match them, and dispatch them as we think of baptisms, weddings, and funerals, as some preachers say. That's all part of the ministry in my role. But what am I primarily to do? Feed the sheep, Acts 20 says. Preach the word. And this is what the Lord will ultimately hold me accountable for as well as you at Duluth Bible Church if this is what you really wanted. Now, pastor teachers here primarily are charged to do what? Preach the word, it says. And what does this involve and not involve? Well, if you've been with us in our study in 2 Timothy... Skip back to chapter 2 and look at verse 15. It says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now before you can get up and preach the word, you need to know what the word is really saying, right? That implies you need to do some study. You need to examine the passage. Word for word, it's grammar, it's vocabulary, it's context, it's background, all of those things. And that is the process of exegesis, where we're not pouring into the passage what we want it to say, we're drawing out what is truly there, that the Spirit of God inspired and put there. So before we can preach, we need to study. And I say that because I listen to some pastors in their messages, and you can tell they're just getting up and winging it. They haven't studied, and what they're doing, in essence, is saying that their word and their opinions matter more than the word of God, that they think that what people really need to hear are their words instead of the word, and we are told here to preach the word. Now, what is the word in reference to in verse 2? Well, again, what is the context? The end of chapter 3 made it very clear in verses 15 through 17 that the Word is the Bible. 
Remember again verse 15? He says, And that from childhood you, Timothy, have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Word is the Bible. And we are told in Acts 20 that elders or pastors are shepherds among the flock and they are to teach the whole counsel of the Word of God. Now why is this to be proclaimed? And what advantages does expository preaching have? Well, first of all, we are to preach the Word because God commands it. It's really just that simple here. God says to do it. It's an imperative mood. It's a command. Preach the Word. But secondly, because of the benefit of the Word that was just referred to. What is the benefit spelled out in chapter 3, verses 15 through 17? Well, number one, it leads people to salvation. But number two, it can equip completely and prepare the man of God for every good work. Its value is spelled out. Now, why does it do that? Because it's the inspired Word of God. It's unique. There's no other book like it. And as I've said before, the Holy Spirit inspired this book, and it is living and powerful, far more powerful than anything I'm going to say here tonight or when I preach. And the Spirit of God inspired it. And that's why when you take it out and use it, it's very effective. People either react to it or they believe in it. And I've said before facetiously that, you know, it's living and powerful. It's almost as though if you had a stethoscope and you put it on there and you put those prongs in your ears and you listened, you'd hear lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. It's alive. Do you know of any other book like that? No, there isn't any. And that's why it's unique. It's called the Holy Scriptures in chapter 3 there. Why? Because it's set apart, as we saw Sunday, the meaning of holy. It's unique. Now we had uh, some, I won't say who, but we've had a couple come to our church recently, and I met them at the back door a few Sundays ago. And I said, well, hi there. I, I didn't, I've not seen you here before. And she said, well, that's because it's our first time here. I said, oh, well, great. I'm really glad you could come. And what brought you here? She said, well, we watched online for a couple of weeks, and we really appreciated the fact that you are an expository preacher. And when she said that, that was like music to my ears. But it also raised a question in my mind, as not many people talk about expository preaching. I said, well, tell me, what is your understanding of expository preaching? She says, well, we just want to hear the Bible taught, you know, preferably verse by verse, and very few actually teach the Bible or Go through passages like you do. So we really appreciate that. And I thought, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> That's wonderful. And they've come back. But what are some of the advantages of expository preaching? As we have had here over the years at DBC, and by the grace of God, we'll continue to do so until the Lord returns. Well, one advantage is that it magnifies the verbal plenary inspiration of Scripture. Just as Paul said in verse 16 at the end of chapter 3, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It's inspired. That's the number one reason why past, some pastors don't preach the Bible, because they don't really believe it's the inspired Word of God. I mean, if we really believed that, wouldn't we value this more highly? and say, well, this is what I want on my menu every week that I'm going to serve as a pastor teacher instead of my bad jokes and stories that sometimes people don't even understand and I have to repeat them twice and it goes all downhill from there. <laughs> so that's one reason. The second reason is that when you preach expositorily or oftentimes verse by verse through a book of Scripture like we're doing tonight in 2 Timothy, you see verses in their context, rather than just plucked out of context, uh, a verse quoted individually here or there, 
like oftentimes the Jehovah's Witnesses do when they come to your door. You know, they'll just cite a verse and take it out of left field. And you say, well, do you even know the context for that? Oftentimes they don't. They don't even know the flow of a passage. But thirdly, an advantage for expository preaching is that it forces the pastor to teach the whole counsel of the Word of God and not skip over hard passages that are hard to understand or maybe hard to even apply because they go across the grain of our flesh or our culture or whatever it may be. And there are some very hard passages in Scripture that may be convicting, challenging, that call for us to submit to the Word of God, to have humility, to recognize we're not sufficient for this. The Spirit of God has to give us what we stand in need of. A fourth advantage is that expository preaching causes pastors to emphasize what Scripture emphasizes rather than just, you know, riding our favorite hobby horses. You listen to some preachers and, you know, they talk about money all the time. Tithing. Sometimes they make a big issue out of the Bible translation. Are you using the King James tonight? Well, you're more spiritual if you are. That's kind of the idea. Instead of what Scripture emphasizes, the character of God, His nature or attributes, the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ or the grace of God, the promises of God, walking by faith, etc. Here's a fifth advantage to expository preaching that it limits accusations of targeting or pulpit whipping by the pastor. I can't tell you how many times, in fact, this even happened with the couple who came who said, thank you for the expository preaching. The husband came a little later and he said, were you listening to our conversation in the car ride here to church today? Because it seemed like everything you addressed is what we just talked about. And I said, well, that's the effect of the Spirit of God using the Word of God to minister to the people of God in the providence of God. No, I'm not out to target people when I preach, though all the Word of God is applicable and relevant and profitable. We just saw the end of chapter 3. A sixth reason why expository preaching is advantageous is because it's easier to follow from week to week. In fact, when... I wonder, well, what am I going to preach next? I don't have to think too hard and figure it out. It's just going to be like tonight, chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, the next section of this epistle. And then it allows you as a believer, after we've had our hour of teaching here, to go back and read and reread the passage that we just studied that maybe you took notes on with your handout here tonight. And so it allows for all those advantages and I have to say, expository preaching is a lost art. In fact, I remember hearing uh, J. Dwight Pentecost, who taught at Dallas Seminary for decades, now with the Lord, uh, saying that very thing about 20 years ago before he passed away. It's uh, quite a statement about the day and age in which we live. So may, by the grace of God, we continue to preach the word. But secondly, we see here that we are told to be ready in season and out of season. And so pastor teachers are charged as well to be ready to proclaim God's word at all times. Be ready. Be instant, the old King James says. You know, the root word here is histemi, which means to stand, and epi means up. And so it means to be standing up. Standing at the ready, in other words. Be ready at all times to preach the word of God. You know, a true minister of God never really takes a vacation from serving the Lord. That means even on your vacation when you're supposed to be relaxing, you need to be ready, if need be, to share the word of God. And how many times has this been true? You go on a vacation, maybe it's down there in Mexico and you're relaxing on the beach and you get an opportunity to share the gospel. The Lord is saying, be ready at all times. And I will say this as far as pastor teachers as well. If God has given us a spiritual gift, such as a pastor or teacher, 
though that may wane in terms of what we do formally, the gift is never removed. That's why even though I think, you know, Pastor Dave Knudsen is retiring, I'll tell you this, the guy's never going to step down from being ready to share the word of God and minister to people. He is going to serve until the tires come off the car. And knowing Dave, I think that's probably going to happen if the Lord doesn't come back first. Now, the third thing we see here is that we are not only to preach the word and be ready at all times, but also convince and rebuke. Convince and rebuke. And the word for convince here speaks of correction. That's the meaning of the Greek word here. So there are times where a pastor needs to persuade or convince, but the idea really is correction with persuasion and rebuking. And this is the really fun part of ministry. (laughs) The part I look forward to every week. And you see in the Word of God like 1 Timothy 5, verse 20, where it says, if an elder has sinned he is to, and, and done so before all, he is to be rebuked publicly. In fact, the passage goes on to say, that all may fear. That's pretty sobering. Or in Titus 1, 9, it says he is to correct those who are in opposition who oppose what is true, refuting false teachers and teaching, as he has been himself faithfully taught the word. He is to stand up for it and hold fast to it and correct others. And so we see that this is unpleasant, but it's necessary, whether it's on a personal, private level or whether it's in a corporate, public setting. This is needful at times. And that's why our our preaching and teaching at Duluth Bible Church, as you know, as the Word of God itself has correction and rebuke within it, you have to almost ignore certain passages if you're going to, you know, stop correction and rebuke as you teach. Because Paul did it, Peter did it, John does it. I mean, what part of the Bible doesn't have reproving and correcting? But the order of the day today is, no, we don't want that. We just want nice, smooth words that make me feel relaxed instead of convicted. And there is definitely a place for correction and conviction. But let's face it, who likes to be corrected? Go ahead and raise your hand. I just love it. Man, I come to church and I can't wait to get corrected. We don't think that way. In fact, our flesh and our pride says, I'm right most of the time, I don't need correction. But when you come to church and you listen to the Word of God taught, you realize, hmm, maybe my thinking has been out of alignment and I need an adjustment, a realignment to the truth of the Word of God. That's what expository preaching will do. Now, thirdly, or fourthly, I should say, We are told here to exhort in verse 2. Convince, rebuke, exhort. And the word for exhort here is parakaleo. Parakaleo. The Holy Spirit is called the paraclete in Scripture. Now, I didn't say parakeet, but paraclete. And it comes from two words. Para meaning beside, like parallel, and kletos meaning one who who comforts or encourages or exhorts. And most translations have here the word exhort rather than encourage, but it could be translated either way. Depends on how you view the context. And I would say most translators here prefer exhort because they think the context is convince, rebuke, and exhort, which has a kind of a stronger connotation. Encourage is a little softer. But really, when you think about the word encourage, what does it mean? It means to put courage into somebody. And are there times where the word of God not only cuts because it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit? In fact, Paul said in 1 Timothy, 
Rebuke them sharply in certain cases. Well, how do you rebuke sharply if the word doesn't cut sometimes? So there is that. But there are also times where we need to be built up because we're downtrodden and we need to be lifted up. And there are times where we lack courage. And when you see in the word of God who the Lord is, what he has done for us, what he will do for us, and the and the testimony of other saints and how they lived, it can be encouraging for us to do the same. Like Paul, when he was put in jail in Rome, he writes in Philippians chapter 1, that you know what? You might think that this has shut down the gospel going out. It's actually led to the furtherance of the gospel because as the brethren see me putting my neck on the line for Christ, they're emboldened to preach the gospel even more. It has that effect. And so, it could be understood in either way, this particular word, exhort here. But in, in either case, it is to be coupled with two things, according to verse 2, long-suffering and teaching. And the word long-suffering here refers to patience towards people in particular. It's a word macrothumia, rather than patience amidst trials and circumstances, and by the way, why would this passage say, preach the word of God with conviction, correction, exhortation, but by the way, remember to be patient? Well, do we always get what the Lord's trying to point out in our life right away? No. Is he patient towards us? Yes. In fact, as you look at your life and the trajectory of growth, it can sometimes be very minimal over a long period of time, and God is very patient with us. So he's saying to pastors here to be patient with their congregations, with their fellow believers as they're teaching. But could I flip that around too? Does the same standard apply with your pastor? Are you patient and long-suffering towards me or any of your other pastors? We should be towards one another. And the word that's used here for teaching, that's the second thing, convince, rebuke, exhort, with teaching, it's actually the word didaskalia, which speaks of doctrine. In fact, 17 times this word is used in the three pastoral epistles. That accounts for 33, one-third of all uses of that word in the New Testament. So he's saying to pastors, use doctrine. And I'll tell you, doctrine's gotten a really bad rap in our day. That, you know, that's just for eggheads at the seminary. And I have found that when people think that way, they tend to be susceptible to false doctrine when they downplay its importance. Now, it is true that you can just have doctrine, doctrine, doctrine with very little application. And obviously here we see in this passage a balance of both. Both are needed. Now, what is to accompany each of these Activities, well, we just, we just went over those two things. So we've seen in verses 1 and 2, charges for ministry in the last days. Now we see conditions of the church in the last days in verses 3 and 4. Paul says, but the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires... Because they have itching ears, they will heap for themselves teachers, and they will turn away their ears from the truth and be turned aside to fables. What is this time that is coming? Well, in the context, it refers to the last days, chapter 3, verse 1. And as, you, as we saw in our previous study, the last days is now. We're in the last days. In fact, the last days technically were from the days of the apostles, the first century church, right up to the present, the entire church age, because Paul and Timothy believed they were living in the last days. And let me just tell you, saints, if the last days were 1,900 years ago, we are on the last hour, maybe the last minute of the last days. The time is getting very short before his appearing in his kingdom. Therefore, with all the more urgency, we need to follow what the Word of God says. And what does it say? That 
the church at large will do in the last days. They will heap up to themselves teachers because they have itching ears and they'll turn away their ears from the truth and be turned aside to fables. We see here this time will be characterized by a rejection of truth and sound doctrine. In the active voice it says here, they will turn away from these things. Active voice is their choice, and they do this. And what always fills the vacuum, there's never a spiritual void on planet Earth. Do you know that? When men turn away from the truth, something else will fill its place, namely lies and, de and deception. It'll be replaced with fables, or the Greek word here for fables is muthos, from which we get myths, as the old King James says. You know, it's unfortunate. People often say, well, I don't believe in anything. I don't think there's such a thing. You can reject the truth and just be completely neutral. Not at all. In fact, what we see going on today in churches is that they're not preaching the word. They're entertaining their congregations. In fact, that's why you can have massive congregations like down in uh, Houston, Texas, at Joel Olstein's church, where they have thousands at their services every week, 30, 40,000 church members, etc. I like what Warren Wearsby, a faithful pastor of the past, who's with the Lord, said in his commentary. He said, the fact that a preacher has a large congregation is not always a sign that he's preaching the truth. In fact, it may be evidence that he is tickling people's itching ears and giving them what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear. Very important difference. And that is why if you want a, a mega church, we can build a mega church. I know how to do it. I know the formula. Just change the gospel. Add some works to it. That will appeal to the pride of man. Take away the offense of the cross that Galatians 5 speaks of. That's one thing. Shorten the preaching time so that we're not actually studying the Bible because that takes mental engagement, right? And replace it instead with lots and lots of music to kind of have a rock concert every Sunday to draw them in so people feel entertained. And then have lots and lots of programs in the church, etc. And you'll get people to come. But faithful Bible teaching, that is not the order of the day. Now, what determines the spiritual diet that a person or a congregation receives? Well, according to this passage, it's the people themselves. This passage is saying, in essence, you get what you want. And you see that throughout Scripture. In fact, it says in the Psalms of the Exodus generation that once they had come out of Egypt, Egypt hadn't come out of them yet. And so as God was leading them through the wilderness, giving them very clear direction under Moses and Joshua, they turned against the Lord and said, we want to go back to Egypt, even though you did these amazing miracles to lead us out of bondage there. How quickly we forget our former bondage. And they wanted to go back. And it says that God granted them their request. Not that they went back to Egypt, but he sent leanness into their souls. And that's what happens when people turn away from the word of God to fables and reject the truth and sound doctrine. But notice this passage says, according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And the word itching could be translated tickled. And people like to have their ears tickled. And by the way, let me go back to this point here. They'll heap up for themselves teachers. That is so easy in our day, probably easier than in any other generation before us. Why? Social media. You can find any kind of teacher you want on YouTube or whatever you listen to. The airways are flooded with every brand, breed, and stripe of doctrine and preacher out there today. 
and it can suck you in. And before you know it, you're listening to some teacher who's out of balance or false because you like their style and they have smooth words that tickle your ears. You know, the order of today is oftentimes people saying things like this. Well, I like this sign at the very top. The guy in the back row has a crossless symbol. We want a crossless message because the cross can stumble and offend. The person next to that crossless guy, she has a sign that says, only good news. We don't want to hear the bad news, even though you won't appreciate the good news without the bad news too. And by the way, there's a lot of bad news in the Bible, but it's true bad news. And then you can see the other signs here. You know, don't talk about hell. Please refer to sin as bad choices, etc. Tell me again how much God wants to bless me, smiley face, etc., etc. That's the order of the day. Now, I'd like you to take your Bibles and let's look at some passages here and compare them with 2 Timothy 4. Turn with me to Romans chapter 16. And I want to show you a characteristic of false teachers. Whether it's Paul describing them, Peter, or Jude, there is a common trait among false teachers that fits with what we just read in 2 Timothy 4. Romans 16, verse 17, Paul writes, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own, their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple or the naive is the idea. Notice what kind of words and speech? Smooth words, not sharp words, smooth words that are easier to go down. And flattering speech, which appeals to something in our sin nature, like our pride. That's how Paul describes false teachers. Now turn with me next to 2 Peter, chapter 2. And let's compare Scripture with Scripture. In 2 Peter 2, beginning in verse 1, 2 Peter 2, 1, he says, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness they will exploit you, with deceptive words. Now, if you're going to extort money out of people because you're a covetous ministry or preacher, what kind of words are you going to use? Well, not words that might offend the, the audience, but words that appeal to them. And I've mentioned in recent days, teaching on Sundays about true grace, how there's this movement called the hypergrace movement that has really flourished in the last 15 years. But it grew out of not coincidentally, the prosperity preaching movement. And prosperity preachers like Joel Olstein will always tell you just how wonderful everything is, your best life now. God wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and wise and have, you know, an ultra-bright smile, just like the preacher. And that is a lie. Sometimes God allows tremendous trials in a believer's life for things to get very hard. In fact, the only way that your best life can be now is if you're unsaved. This is as good as it gets. For us as believers, this is as bad as it will ever get down here on planet Earth because our future with the Lord is very bright. I love what Proverbs 4 says, the path of the just is as the shining light that gets brighter and brighter until the perfect day or the midday sun is the idea. For us as believers in Christ, this world is very dark, but we know 
that with the Lord, when he comes back and in the future eternal kingdom, it's going to be very bright. And so we are casting our hopes upon that day, not today. Turn with me to uh, actually stay here and look at verse 18. Peter goes on to describe false teachers in verse 18. He says, For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who actually have escaped, etc. Notice again, these false teachers appeal to something in our sin nature to draw that out. And it's often flattery. It's often smooth words. Look at Jude with me next, right before the book of Revelation. Notice what Jude says. Something very similar to what we've just read. Jude 16. He says, these are, these false teachers are grumblers, complainers. And by the way, doesn't that make sense? If they're really not walking by faith and they don't know how to faith rest, they can never really be content in this world, even with difficult circumstances and trials that come their way. So they're always grumbling and complaining. Walking according to their own lusts, their own sinful nature, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. Flattery. And I just want to say this, beware of flattery. In my reading of some 25 books or so by hyper-grace teachers in the last year, I've seen that they are characterized by flattery. Virtually every book, I could have a whole message tonight just giving you example after example after example. Here are just some of the things they say. They say, what is the reason why you were created? Simply to be loved, period. Now that's a half-truth right? Were you created to be loved, to be loved on by God? Absolutely, as the object of his divine love. You're a beloved one, right? We learned that Sunday. But is that the only reason you were created? Just to be a recipient of constant one-way love and never reciprocate it to others and the Lord? That's a biblical imbalance. That's very self-focused, and it appeals to our narcissistic flesh, our pride. I read in another book recently where the writer says, you are your dad, you're referring to our Heavenly Father, you are your, your daddy's dream come true. When God opens his wallet, he sees a picture of you in it, and he goes, ah. And I'm reading that thinking, that is just sappy. You don't read that in the Bible. That may be his opinion. Does he love you? Yes, but come on. Or how about this one? Another writer says, God believes in you more than you believe in yourself. I read that and said, huh? (laughs) That seems to be turning around the subject and the object of faith. We are to do the believing in the Lord. God does not believe in us. That's all inverted. That puts man on a pedestal and God down here. Do you see what's happening? But it appeals to the pride of our flesh and we love to be flattered. And I like what one brother said to me recently, and I found this on the internet, so it backs it up. The church cannot be the salt of the earth if we keep sugarcoating the gospel. Isn't that good? Very true. And then I also saw this. Biblical warning, sugar-coated preaching is dangerous to your soul. By the way, is too much sugar bad for your body? Yeah. It's true in the spiritual realm as well. And so we've seen charges for ministry in the last days, verses 1 and 2. We've seen church conditions in the last days, verses 3 and 4. We also see the concluding commands for the last days here in verse 5. What does it say in verse 5? But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And so, in these last days, ministers for Christ, and by the way, that applies to all of us, because we're all servants of Jesus Christ, or should be, we are told to be sober in all things. 
It's translated here, be watchful, but the idea is of a sober mindset, a spiritual alertness where we're not asleep at the switch. We're spiritually awake and in tune and and therefore discerning about what's going on in the world and our lives, and we can see God's hand at work, and we know what He is, what this life is all about, and why we're here, and where we're going. We have purpose, and we haven't forgotten that. That's the idea, a sober mindset in life. And then, secondly, he says here, endure afflictions. Endure afflictions. And again, I put a Greek word on here so you can see the, the actual literal meaning Patheo means to suffer or feel, and kakos is the Greek word for what is bad or evil. could be translated either, either way. And was Paul going through some evil affliction, what is bad? Absolutely. He was in jail for Jesus Christ, awaiting execution. He was literally on death row when he's writing 2 Timothy. In fact, the next section we're going to read in verses 6 through 8, He describes how he's going to be poured out as a drink offering. He will be beheaded for Jesus Christ. And when it comes to this world, it is never a friend of the believer. It is a foe, the Lord Jesus said. We are pilgrims and strangers walking through down here, so we shouldn't expect wonderful treatment from the world. Don't be surprised if you're persecuted, if you don't get the promotion at work, if people talk about you, At work, behind your back, you're ridiculed or unjustly accused or slandered. That is all kakopatheo, as Paul would say here. And of course, there's varying degrees of this. And he's telling Timothy, don't be surprised. In fact, according to the end of the book of Hebrews, Timothy was put in jail just within the next year or so after 2 Timothy is written. So this would be experienced by Timothy himself. And then he says in verse 5, do the work of an evangelist. In other words, we all have a ministry of evangelism to engage in. Sharing the gospel is the idea. And though as Ephesians 4, 11, and 12 say that some are gifted as evangelists, the Bible also says that we all are ambassadors for Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 5. And I believe that the pastor teacher, primarily Timothy here in this context, he is not only to teach the Word of God and preach it, as we saw, but he is also to be a gospel spreader. And by the way, the world needs good news. Isn't it amazing that right after he says, kakopatheo, endure evil or bad, he turns around and uses a word for good. Spread the good news. So while the world is coming after you and it's bad and it's bearing down, that's bad. You can be spilling out what is good what it needs for its eternal salvation. And he says here, fulfill your ministry. Finish your course. Don't give up, dear believer. Again, in light of what? The appearing of Jesus Christ in his kingdom. Christ is coming for us. And I'll tell you, if the rapture happens today, do you know that that eternal kingdom he mentioned in verse 1 could be just seven years away? Yeah, it's wonderful. We're going to be raptured, be with the Lord Jesus in heaven, potentially today. But it could be just seven years later that that kingdom will be set up on earth and never overthrown again. And all wrongs will be righted. We could be that close. So fulfill your ministry, dear saint, as a believer. Just like Paul said in Acts 20, 24. None of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy. And the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify, to do the work of an evangelist, the gospel of the grace of God. And we've all been given a race or a path in terms of our course as believers. Are you going to finish it? Now, what does all this imply for us as a church? Well, all this implies for us that we are to follow God's standards in calling, not man's standards or the world's standards or other churches' standards. It's not about the size of our building or our congregation or do we have a large staff or what is our annual budget? Do we have a lot of money as a church? Those are the things that some churches look at. But what this also requires on our part as a church is Do we have an appetite for the Word of God? Is that really what we want? 
undiluted, faithfully delivered. Do we want it personally and privately in our own study of the Word of God? Do we want it corporately as a church when we come together? Or do we want entertainment? This will also require that we come to the Lord humbly, teachably, and be correctable. As the Word of God does that. Are you willing to let the Word of God do that? And if this is true, the result will be we will be a church that fulfills the pattern of Ephesians 4. Where the gospel is preached, people are saved, they come to church, they're taught by pastors and teachers the truth in love, they are built up or edified and equipped to do the work of the ministry, they go out and evangelize and the church is built. That's the pattern we want to see fulfilled. But it starts with our appetite for the Word of God. Preach the Word. That is the preaching of God's Word in the last days. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your truth tonight. So we've seen it in the pages of your Word. Not always re really comfortable, but sometimes we need to be nudged, as your Word does. And thank you for the correction that you even provide through the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Thank you for the growth that you provide in Christ and the amazing grace that makes this all happen through your Son. I thank you for these believers here tonight, and we even just um, turn to you now during our prayer time, and thank you for the privilege and the ministry of prayer that we can have at this time, all because of the throne of grace and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Advocate. We pray this now in, in his precious name.